It's been a busy spring here at Epic Gardening. Lots been going on in the garden. I wanna take you around today on a complete tour of everything that's happened in the last 18 months since I moved into my very own piece of land here in San Diego. So the first thing that you'll notice is, well, you might not notice, but I certainly do, is that these gates have been completely rebuilt and restained. When this house was purchased, I think I bought it in May of 2020, it was a flipped home. And so a lot of this stuff was sort of done kind of by flippers. So we actually redid this gate. And what I'm standing on right now is probably the thing I'm the most stoked about as far as big projects here. I'm actually standing on a proper garden pathway that's been sealed off. It goes out this way in the raised bed garden, out there to the backyard. But right now we are standing right in the middle of a poppin' raised bed front yard garden, much like the one I had at my old place for you original Epic Gardening subscribers. So right here, we have a bed. I actually just did a little harvesting. Take a look at this right here. This is a mini Kasaku 50 cabbage. Absolutely beautiful sort of Chinese Napa style cabbage. Very dense, very great for pickling, but doesn't grow too big. It kind of grows up like this. So if you're looking for something, probably not the season quite yet for it, but when you get to fall, mini Kisaku 50 is a really, really solid cabbage. But this bed here is the Birdie's Tall 8-in-1 bed. It's the one that I have here in the front yard. And we did like a row of calendulas up front, bring in some pollinators, bring in some visual beauty, because the rest of the bed, as you can see, is mostly just greens. So the greens in the back, think about it. You want to think sun placement always, right? So sun's coming this way. Greens get a lot of shade, especially as you move into summer. You brighten up the front with the calendulas. It looks incredible. And of course, as you can see, it's really been performing. The only thing you really need to do here is as these flowers get spent and you want to come in and deadhead them. I don't have a great example quite right now, but let's say this one gets spent, rip that top off, reset it, make it look really nice. So the rest of the raised bed garden is over here. And I kind of want to call your attention to this bed right here. So this is our urban short round bed with a Corton steel siding. But really what's important is if you're doing raised beds, what I think is a really smart idea is to put tall growing stuff in low beds and low growing stuff in tall beds. So what we have here is blue jade sweet corn. This is, I believe a Japanese style corn that is harvested somewhat small and is very, very tasty. And when you plant corn like this, you wanna plant it in a block. Now this is of course a circle, but the same principle applies because corn is a wind pollinated plant. So when this grows up, what happens is the tassels at the top, which is the male part, are gonna get sort of pushed around by the wind. That pollen will fall and land on the silks, which are attached to the top of that cob. So that's why you wanna be planting your corn in a block like this, so that when the wind comes through, that pollination happens, they're brushing up against one another, the pollens are dispersed in this area. And also, if you think about it, I'm a tall guy, I wanna stand up and I want my corn to right, be right about at eye level. If I planted it in this bed right here, that wouldn't make a lot of sense, right? Because even I at six foot four, I'd be reaching up trying to grab something up here, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So let me show you what I did in this bed. In this bed right here, you might be saying, well, Kevin, this is tomatoes, why would you plant tomatoes? It's gonna grow really tall. No, because I planted a determinate bush tomato. There's some bush romas, and I forgot the other variety, but nevertheless, these are all bushing. They're not gonna get too much higher than about here, eye level for me. And besides the tomatoes, of course, this is sort of a classic summer planting bed. So I've got basil here, basil on this side, basil right here, and I also planted some alyssum. This is sort of a purple alyssum, I believe, on this side over here, and I think there's probably one over here. Alyssum's really great because it brings in a type of beneficial that actually lays eggs in tomato hornworms. So if you plant alyssum with your tomatoes, it's a pretty solid combination. So classic summer bed right here. Over here, you can see some struggles. We are no strangers to struggles at Epic Gardening. I fail probably almost as much as I succeed, to be honest with you, in the garden. So you can see I have a half planted out bed of beans. Now these were grown and then transplanted in, and then I direct sowed over here. And as you can see, just about one came up. Now, why is that? It is pretty much because a skunk or raccoon has come in and just decimated this. It dug up all the seeds, it messed with them, and this lonely survivor actually made it. And so if you notice something like that, first of all, you're gonna have to do something to prevent. We're testing a couple options. We'll prepare a video for you guys pretty soon, but I'm just gonna have to re-sow. Sometimes you just gotta chalk it up to a loss, re-sow, or maybe transplant in, and, and they're a little bit larger and you'll be in a good spot. Over here, this is a bed that is much more full and lush. This is a lettuce and beans bed which is a great combination, especially if you let your beans grow 
really, really long because beans are nitrogen fixers, but I believe their nitrogen fixation and the actual nitrogen they deploy into the soil really only matters if you let them grow for quite some time. If you're harvesting them right away, then it's not a great idea, but nitrogen is hugely used by leafy greens. And so as you can see, beans are doing fantastic. We have sort of a ruffled style lettuce here. We have this speckles lettuce right here. And then of course the beans, you just pick them as they come. And here's something that's kind of interesting. You have a theme bed here, beans and lettuce. And then you use the edge of the bed and just make a play to connect to the other side here. So this is our center cut squash, which is both Jacques and I's favorite squash. And if you take a look, let's dig in here real quick. You can see we do have some actual center cut squash developing here. In fact, quite a few. There's one that got a little sandwiched under here. This one might not make it. Let's pour one out for this little poor guy. But either way, it's really starting to produce. And something I think that you may be wondering is, hey, doesn't Kevin have powdery mildew on this squash plant? No, some squash leaves actually just look like this. They have this sort of silvery interior. So don't freak out if you have a squash leaf like that. What you wanna freak out is if you're looking at the underside and you start seeing little puffs of sort of a powdery white substance, that's when you really have a powdery mildew problem. If you're looking at a variety that simply has silvering along the veins, don't worry about it at all. You're totally fine. Okay, what else do we have going on here in this front? We have some arugula. You can tell this is bolting a little bit. No big deal here. Now here, this is another sort of interesting combination. This bed looks half planted. And the reason why, again, is because a skunk came through and wrecked my cucumbers. So I put three cucumbers in, two basil, and a couple borage, and it sort of ripped out all of this. But nevertheless, this is just one of those beds that I'm just planting just because. I just wanna see how it works. I got a dark opal basil in the middle. I've got a couple borage plants and then I've got a couple cucumbers. And something I think that's important is you don't necessarily have to solve your trellising immediately. If you need to get something in the ground in the garden, just put it in and work on your trellis later. This is certainly still young enough that I can trellis this up pretty much whatever I want. I can build a bamboo teepee style trellis. I can do some sort of bent cattle panel and it'll work perfectly fine. So over here, this is the last bed in the front layer out here in the front yard. I'm telling you, the Epic Homestead has really grown since I moved in about 18 months ago, guys. This might be the prettiest bed that I have and also one of the more productive. So this gangly looking tomato plant is in fact a tomatillo. There's four of these growing and they're just sizing up right now. You can see they're starting to flower. So pretty soon we'll have some good info for you on tomatoes, but take a look at this. I'm really starting to become in love with alyssum, especially this sort of purple alyssum. It is a beautiful sort of carpety, colorful ground cover that you can add to a bed like this that like I said brings in hoverflies, brings in bees, brings in all sorts of great stuff and not to mention it just looks honestly gorgeous and then hiding in here you see a little bit of a reminiscent of that cucumber bed where I've got this dark opal basil which is a gorgeous gorgeous variety of basil. Look at that I mean that's just popping with color and also growth and then you can see this borage over here which is one of the more productive flowers you're ever gonna grow. Trust me, if you're growing borage, you're gonna grow it one time, the seeds are gonna spread, and then you will never worry about it again because it'll fly all over the garden and you can just pop it out and transplant it into wherever you want. So plant it, but be careful because you might be digging it up a lot in the future. So in this little bed here, this is just the Birdie's original short round, so the corrugated side, but I've got some Alaska style nasturtiums. It's called Alaska because of this variegation here. You can see you have like a really crisp and pretty variegation on this leaf. There's a ton of different nasturtium varieties. That's just one of them. You know, you can of course select for a different style of flower, but nasturtiums are great. Honestly, if you don't know what to put in a bed, just throw some nasturtiums in, forget about it because it's going to look absolutely gorgeous. I threw a couple sunflowers in here because why not, quite frankly. And this is just an idea of, I have a ton of productive space growing here. I wanna add some flowers, I wanna add some beauty. And nasturtiums actually have sort of a trap crop effect where they can attract some pests, unlike Bobka, she's not a pest. She is our official mascot here at Epic Gardening. But nasturtiums can attract pests away from other plants. So it's a great thing for beauty, but also for function. Now, I've got a couple more beds to show you up here in the front. This one's kind of weird. Like I said, I've been planting some weird combos this season. This is sort of a summer style broccoli. You can see it's starting to flower just a little bit. So I missed my harvest window just slightly here, still edible though. So I can just chop that floret off and I'm good to go. Then of course I just crammed a ton 
of sunflowers in here because quite honestly I started like 200 sunflowers and I don't know what to do with them so I'm throwing them everywhere I possibly can. Now when you come over here this is a bed I'm really excited about. Down here we have the strawberry bed for the season. So this is in a Birdies 8 and one original. I wanted a really low large bed because I want a lot of strawberries because strawberries do this. They throw out what are called runners and what they'll do is you can plant, let's say one, two, three, four, five. I planted 15 in here, but by the end of the season, I'm gonna have probably 30 because they will clone themselves out. So they'll throw a runner out like this and you can actually see there'll, there'll be a leaf formation and then beneath here, right where this node is, if you sort of pin that down into the ground, it will root itself and it will create an entirely different strawberry plant. So what I've been doing this season is up until about now-ish, I've been removing all the flowers. Why? because I just planted this crop of bare root strawberries out. I wanna focus on the foliage growth until such point that it really is time for it to start to flower and fruit, which is getting to be that point as we get towards the end of May here. So now I'm just gonna let these ones grow. So that's the strawberry bed. It's gonna fill in and have juicy, juicy straws all summer long. This bed, just more summer squash, more sunflowers. But I've got a couple beds to show you, including this incredible arch. So. Many of you who've been watching the channel for a while, you've probably been wondering, what's Kevin finally gonna do with this arch? Well, I've made a decision, my friends. I've put it right in between this paver pathway. I've thrown some Cecile Bruner roses on. This is a climbing rose with a really sort of small, delicate white flower. And I have to say, it is one of the most fragrant flowers and one of the most productive. You can see these, these sort of canes have gone crazy here. And what I've been doing is just sort of weaving them up and down and training them through. So this one right here, for example, it's grown a little bit since we last saw it. I'm just going to do that. And then when this keeps on growing, I'm going to go over and under and over and under. And eventually everything you see here, all this beauty, all this beauty will actually be covering this entire thing. And when I walk through to zip on down to the backyard, it's just going to feel really, really cool. Now I do want to call your attention to this. This is the mint bed, mint madness. Now mint, we just did a video on, you don't need to try to grow mint, but I don't know, this looks kind of good if you ask me. I did sculpt this mint a little bit. I did do a little bit of shaping and pruning, and we've got about five varieties in here that all look absolutely amazing. Spearmint's right here, peppermint's right here, I think chocolate mint is right here. And so every morning, or some mornings at least, I'll come out, I'll prune a couple of these stalks for harvesting, but also for shaping. I'll throw those stalks in some water and just let it sit in the fridge. I got some nice cold mint water and then this bed just keeps on producing. So as we go slowly into the backyard, you'll see the green stalks. This is the solution. If you are a balcony gardener, an apartment gardener, condo gardener, townhouse gardener, any of those living situations, this thing absolutely kills the game. There's the classic system here. This is the five tier. This is the seven tier leaf system. These are just a couple ideas that I think make a lot of sense in a vertical system like this because the footprint is two foot by two foot. You don't have that much space. You're growing vertically, of course. So this one, there's six holes per level, five levels. So 30 plants in two square feet. I've got shishito peppers and lettuce on this one. So lettuce, I think, is a really good application if you're a salad person. This thing will have you clipping lettuce like no one's business. Over here, beans actually, weirdly, make a lot of sense because you can plant two beans per cell and they perform really well. And so, of course, on this one, this is the seven tier system. You have 42 planting sites. You could plant 84 beans, which is a ton of beans. And you can have multiple successions of beans throughout the season. And so last time when I did beans in a green stock, I could just rotate this make sure that it's getting adequate sun. So maybe do a half turn every day. And I was pulling pounds and pounds of beans off this at the old garden for like months at a time. So it was absolutely incredible. So if you are one of those gardeners who lives in smaller spaces, I think these solutions actually make a ton of sense for you. Now, over here, this is what I call my laundry water artichoke patch. So if you remember, if you follow the Epic Homesteading channel, this is fully fed off of that little pipe right there that comes out of my laundry. So I have not watered this directly probably in a year and we've harvested about 10 or 12 artichokes this season. You can see they're looking a little bit sparse right now because what we've had to do is of course clip them off. These two here are a little bit far gone. You can see the leaves start to separate out. It's going to be very fibrous, very woody. 
So what do you do? Well, you just let these flower and you'll actually have one of the most beautiful flowers you'll ever see. It's a huge sort of thistle-like flower that's bright purple that bees go absolutely crazy for. And when they get in there, it actually looks like the pollen is blue because of an optical illusion. When they fly out, you can see the pollen is actually in fact whitish or yellowish. But when they're in there, it sort of looks like this neon blue pollen. It's really, really crazy. So if you want to see how we did this gray water system here, you can of course always go check out Epic Homesteading. Now, let's take a look at the dragon fruit patch, which I think might be huge this season. So here we are in Dragon Fruit Alley. This has gone through a couple iterations over the course of living here. I think we've settled on a nice solution. So we have these huge 25 gallon pots made out of terracotta. Dragon fruit's a tropical cactus, so it wants a little more moisture than your typical cactus that you would think of. But still, a terracotta pot allows for some nice drainage. Of course, we have the classic dragon fruit trellis, which we made a video about. Now, all these are really sizing up. What you want to see on a dragon fruit, if you're building this trellising structure, is you want to start seeing these stems start to fall down. That's when you know you're in a good position for the season to potentially get some fruit. And speaking of, we actually have our very first dragon fruit flower of the season. I'm so excited about this. I'm crying because I missed it. I did not think it would open last night. So I went to sleep and then of course I wake up and lo and behold, it opens and I'm a sad man. Nevertheless, this is Sugar Dragon. I believe it's a self-pollinating variety, so I didn't miss the window. We had some pollinators in here. So it looks like it's opening right now, guys. In fact, it's actually closing. But if you want to take a peek, you can kind of see what's going on here. So this is where you're going to be taking the pollen from, and the pollen would then be deposited right there. And then it would, of course, travel down into this little system here, come down, and then the fruit will actually start to swell at the base here. So I did miss this one. But if you can see over here, there's two more, and I think I'll be around for those. So maybe you'll see a live stream pretty soon here on the channel. But nevertheless, it's going to be a good year for dragon fruit. And now we need to take a look at the orchard. So over here, we sort of have a hybrid of an orchard and a tree nursery, because you can see there's a lot of trees that we have yet to plant here at the homestead. But this one I wanted to call your attention to. This one I got from my friend Richard, who many of you have seen on the channel. His name is Richard Lee, Grafting Dragon Fruit. He gifted me this yellow long neck fig, which was sort of planted at a weird angle when I first got it. You can see down here the sort of bend of it makes it fall out this way. So I put a little rock underneath to stabilize. But if you notice where I decided to plant it, it's right next to this huge loquat tree, which was actually here on the property when I moved in. So I'm getting this tree to kind of come out this way. Now you can see the new growth is going straight up vertically. I may add another stake here and then I'll support and force a sort of fig bush right here. So I'm sort of dodging this, but I'm being very space efficient with how I'm planting this. The loquat tree just does what it does. We've done some pruning videos here. It popped off this season. We got tons and tons of loquat. So this is sort of my reliable producer for the years to come as the orchard over here really starts to scale up. So this I'm really excited about. We are in, I believe, the first 15 months of this orchard's life. And as you can see, we have a pretty diverse amount of plants and trees here. We have some papaya, which is sort of hanging on. It's not doing too, too much over here. But then right here, we have two different types of pomegranate. One is wonderful and one is parfianca. And I believe we even have some young pomegranate flowers that are starting this season. So you'll see these right here. So this hopefully will be my first pomegranate year. We'll see. Now over here, this entire row is all citrus. I have a yuzu, I have a lime, I have a karakara orange, I have a mandarin orange, I have a satsuma. So this entire thing is all citrus. These are planted four feet apart, which seems absolutely insane. But the whole reason for doing so is I'm gonna prune these in a very specific way so they actually all form a consistent hedge blocking off some view of the neighbors, making me feel like I'm more in my own environment, but also successively ripening different varieties over the course of many, many years. So in my future vision, what I'll see here is basically a wall of citrus with all these different colors of fruit that's sort of hanging and ripe for the picking, quite literally. Now, this is really interesting. This apple tree is, I believe, a Dorset golden apple. There's an Anna and a Dorset golden that work well in my climate. And as you can see, I thought I thinned this apple tree enough. All these I actually pulled off a little bit ago. And you think that might be crazy, but as you can see here, why might you want to do that? Well, look at this tree. Look at this one stem. 
one, two, three, four, five, six apples on one stem on a young tree is absolutely insane. And so what you wanna do, and it's very, very painful, is if I lose the branch, I lose every apple, right? So I can't be losing the branch. So what I wanna do is I wanna come through and say, hey, which of these is not gonna make it? Well, this is a very, very small apple, and yes, I can use this. I need to lighten this a little bit. So I need to pull off maybe this one, I think probably this guy here, right there, and just see, it's still too heavy. So I'm probably gonna end up pulling off maybe this one here. Now maybe that might make it, but otherwise these things would break off. And so you really need to watch and you wouldn't normally wanna let it get to this point. You wanna pull it off a little bit sooner. I thought I did, I guess I didn't do a good enough job. So something that you need to know about these types of fruits. As we walk down, you'll see there's actually a very, very big peach tree here that has started to come in. And I did do a good job of thinning this one out. So it's hard to see the fruit, but I took way more of them off. There's a ton of little pits down here effectively. That's what those look like. This one's blowing up. As we go down, it's just a couple more citrus and a couple more peaches and stone fruits. So this side here is developing just a little bit slower. We put irrigation in, and by the way, all this is also watered by my shower. So on the Homestead channel, you can actually see how we turned this into a gray water shower system that is, every time I take a shower, pouring water into this basin to water all of this citrus. So I'm using water on my property at least twice if possible. Okay, that's the front yard. Let's head on back and see what's going on back there. So here in the backyard, a lot has changed since I moved in. If you guys remember from way, way, way back when I first moved in and gave you the tour, there was nothing here. There were a couple dead trees and it was just dirt and it was just weeds. So of course we still have the pathway coming through. I'm building a little outdoor shower. It gets pretty hot here when you're working in the garden. It's kind of nice to rinse off before you go inside. So this is coming pretty soon. But of course, as you can, I'm sure here, the big feature is the Epic Pond. And there's a lot of growth going on in the Epic Pond from an animals and a plants perspective. So as you walk over here, this is really cool. The pond is watered effectively by an underground reservoir. So what we have here is this little dry set patio. And look, this is water. Everything up to about six inches deep and below is water underneath this entire basin here. So it's about 3,000 gallons of water underneath, which helps keep the water cooler, helps the dissolved oxygen level go up, which means that all the plant life you see behind me in the Epic Pond, as well as the animal life, does a lot, lot better. So let's take a look at that right now. So over here, what I have is, this is the return stream. So this is where the water from the pond comes out of the waterfall, comes all the way down and falls back into this basin. And what I did is I took watercress, which as the name implies, is a fantastic plant to be growing in water. Take a look, this is basically a hydroponically grown plant. For those who are real Epic Gardening fans, you know I started in, in hydroponics. And all you do is you can take little cuttings of this and root it. So what I did is I took a cutting and I put it right there, one cutting. And it has cascaded down in a very natural way, as well as putting a couple over here, just like five or so, and it's cascaded there. And so watercress is actually one of the most nutritious edible greens that you actually can eat from a nutrient density perspective. And so what I'll do, obviously these flower stalk ones, you probably don't wanna eat, but you can snap those off, grab a hunk of this out of the pond, rip the roots off, strip these leaves, just grab the leaves here. Obviously you're gonna to have to wash the pond water off, but the pond water is actually quite clean. So what I can do here is do something like this, grab a bunch of this, you can blend it up into smoothies, you can put it in soups. We actually make a really fantastic watercress leek and potato soup on the Homesteading channel you can take a look at, but I'm actually turning my pond into a productive edible space along with a beautified space. So take a look at this. Here are some of the lilies that we put in a while ago. These lilies have absolutely exploded. You can see every single day, at least in summer and spring, we're getting lily flowers that open, close, open, close. We have some of this, I actually forgot the name of this, but it looks incredible over here. And then we also have some dwarf papyrus over here that I took out of its pot and I planted it in this back edge. Because if you think about you know, what's behind me, well, nothing really. There's sort of a random big hole here and then there's a fence. Well, I'm gonna put something that grows tall in the back so that when the eye looks, the eye has a stopping point at the end of this pond. So I've got that over here. I'm really excited to see how it grows up. 
We'll put a couple photos or videos up here of the Epic Koi. There's six of them now, Butterfly Koi and Standard Koi, in the pond and they're loving life. And it looks like our little friend Bobka is also enjoying it here. She likes to come and have a little drink. Now, behind me, basically an empty wasteland. We grew wheat in the back this season. We also grew a huge, huge cover crop here in the back. And then we chopped and dropped it and we're gonna till it into the ground. We're gonna reset and level this back area. And then pretty soon we're gonna have either a corn maze or a pumpkin patch or a melon patch or a cantaloupe patch, some sort of more wild, unstructured space for growing some of these larger vining style edibles. Over here, one of the big projects that I wanted to put in to the homestead was a way to process all the produce before it gets into the house. I don't have a large house here. It's like 900 square feet or something like that. So I needed an outdoor sink. So we put one in. You can see these are some of those artichokes I was telling you about that we harvested. We pulled some potatoes out earlier. We also even pulled a huge amount of wheat. It's the wheat that I just told you that we grew in that back plot there. So we're gonna be threshing that and trying to make our own bread on the homesteading channel pretty soon. So this is just sort of like a wash station to process stuff, get all the dirt and grime off before it goes into the kitchen to actually be cooked into recipes. This is something that I wanted to show you really quickly. I think it's a cool and fun way to propagate a lot of plants really quickly and efficiently. You can see we've thrown some kind of random plants in here that actually don't expect to propagate through this method. But basically, if you lift it really quickly, it's gonna spray all over the place. It is a water propagating or aeroponically propagating method. So there's air and then water's being sprayed at the bottom. So if you see, this is a Greek columnar basil. What happens is you get really efficient and well-structured roots and they don't really go rotten or anaerobic or anything. So this is very, very healthy. I can go ahead and pop this in the herb bed if I want to. In fact, I might take you on over there right now and do just that. So over here, this is our herb bed that we sort of reset. Sometimes you just need to reset plants. And the way we did that is by propagating, like I just talked about. So the Greek columnar basil that was in here is like really big and scraggly. And an easy way to reset it is just to clone it and restart it down at the beginning of its life. So, you know, you just come in and pull a hole out, hold it roughly at that soil level here. We'll water this in a little bit later on, but really that's all you have to do. And then of course, this is gonna grow into another huge Greek columnar basil. So we did reset this herb bed, it's looking a little sparse right now, but it's been really productive. Come in, grab oregano, sage, thyme, lemongrass for the cooking, which is just a great way to spice up your food. And honestly, one of the more expensive things you'll buy fresh at a farmer's market or a grocery, especially with food prices probably going up a lot this year, an herb bed is a fantastic thing to get started, especially if you're a beginner gardening and you just don't really know where to begin. You can't go wrong with herbs. Over here, this is sort of our in-ground plot. I've got eight plots this way and I've got two over this way. So we've got some cucumbers and squash in this bed through about 10 or 12 peppers in this bed, shishitos, bells, stuff like that. This one is, let's just say a little neglected. We show it all here at Epic Gardening. I messed this one up. I let the fennel go a little bit too long. So it's a honking fennel plant. I'll actually show it to you right now because it's well past its prime, but you can kind of see what that plant ends up looking like when it goes mature. But I'll tell you, still smells, if you like the smell of fennel at least, absolutely incredible. Over here we have bachelor button. This is a plant that is a really, really fantastic and easy growing flower. You pretty much can't go wrong with this. You can actually toss this in like a little glass of wine and just have a nice little dress up, make it look really nice, or you can just let it grow like crazy. Now over here, we've thrown in some eggplants and tomatoes. A lot of this stuff was just planted. It's a little hard to kind of show it off. There's not much going on just yet, but we did plant a, another patch. This is popcorn. This is not the sweet corn. This is actually a popping corn. So we will grow it. It'll grow up tall. There's a couple sunflowers here. Then what we'll do is harvest it, let it dry, and actually pop it like you would a typical popcorn in the microwave. So that'll be really fun. Never grown a popcorn before. Over here, we have some summer loose head cauliflower. So in a zone 10B, where I am here in San Diego, it can be sometimes kind of challenging to grow cauliflowers, brassicas, cabbages, these sorts of things. So we decided to grow a variety that doesn't have as many problems. It grows a little bit more loose. It's better in the heat. And honestly, there's these tiny little sort of loose heads of cauliflower in here and they, they look pretty darn good. I've had one of my better years for anything in the Allium family. I had a huge amount of garlic, which I'll show you in a second, but I do wanna show off these leeks. These were all grown from seed. Take a look 
at these leaks. I mean, these things are absolutely incredible to process. You can, of course, just peel off one of the outer layers, shake this off, take a knife, cut it right there, use as much of this as you want, and you have an incredible, incredible plant. I mean, these, these honestly might even be my favorite over garlic right now, and that's saying a lot because I absolutely love garlic. So we have some leeks in this bed. Over here, we have some bulbing onions. I've pulled most of them, but I'll show you a couple here. These are some red bulbing onions. So they're coming in. They're not quite ready to pull yet. There's a couple more here. There's some really big white bulbing onions over here. Now the final bed back here is the one you see right behind you. This one we just reset and put in a ton of tomatoes. So here's something kind of interesting. You think about the sun pattern, right? The sun is coming in from over about there. That's east. West is right about there. So it's shining in my face right now. Now, if you think about it, if you're planting different types of tomatoes, where would you orient them? That's the question as a gardener. So I have my indeterminate tomatoes on the east or northeast side. And then I have my determinate or bushing style tomatoes up in the front here because why because visually i'm not going to be blocking a shorter one with a taller one and also from a sun access perspective as you come over here what's going to happen these are going to grow really really tall these are going to grow short and if most of the sun is coming in this way throughout the day well then these ones are actually going to get the sun that they need and so we just planted 10 across this way 10 across this way about 18 inches spaced apart and about two feet apart in rows so when this starts to fill in, what we can do is we can actually say, okay, hey, how are we gonna companion plant this? And we'll do a full video on companion planting tomatoes, guys. But we might throw some basil in, we might throw some melissa in, we might throw some cucumbers in, maybe some oreganos, sages, something to kind of fill this in and add a little bit more aesthetic life to the bed, but also add a lot more productivity to the bed. So I'm very, very excited about that. And now, of course, I have to call your attention to the Epic Coop. You've seen our tour of the Epic Coop. The guys at Carolina Coops came out, built an absolutely beautiful coop. I mean, this thing is my absolute dream coop. We have put what's called a predator apron down here. So what I've done is I've taken basically some wire mesh, two by three wire mesh, stapled it to the bottom, and then stapled it down and staked it down out here all around the entire coop. Because what happens is a raccoon's also very smart, will literally dig under and then slaughter all your chickens. So you gotta put your protection in place. With that said, let's go ahead and pop inside. Hey girls, as you can see, I've given them a little bit of love here. I threw one of these mini Kisaku 50 cabbages to them. They're really enjoying it. You can see they're starting to pick it away, but there are a couple modifications I've made to this coop and a couple little product additions that I've really liked. So this is probably the, the, the favorite thing I've added to the coop since I installed it. This is the coop works feeder. So it's just a bulk feeder. And the thing that's really, really nice about it is it has all these little ports at the bottom. So if you have up to, I think, eight or 10 hens, they can eat from the exact same feeder at the same time just by coming in and kind of picking their food out from here. But then it top feeds. So I can dump 50, even 80 pounds in here and I don't have to worry about it until it runs out, which could be literally a month at the rate that these guys are eating. Of course, you can also throw a carabiner on it if you want to, to make sure that nothing gets in if, if you want to. But I think I'm pretty secure in here. The other thing I really like is this water bar. So I was a little nervous. I didn't think they would understand how to use it, but they have. All you need to do is come in and their beak will press right against this. And there you go. You can see the water starting to come out. They get a little excited when it comes out, but they've learned how to drink from that as well. And that's connected to a 50 gallon barrel, which means again, it's all about ease of management with these chickens. I'm not getting eggs from them yet. I'm probably gonna get eggs in maybe three or four months. And in that time, I wanna make sure I could go for a couple days and they're fed and they're watered and they can put themselves to bed and take themselves out with no fear of any predators attacking them at all. So the homestead in late spring, oops, into early summer. So much has changed. I really encourage you to watch some of those first videos when I first bought this place and just see this thing was a dirt lot beforehand. So a lot has changed and hopefully some of these ideas have inspired you to do a little bit more with your garden this season, especially as we run into a world where it's just really uncertain right now. It's never not a good idea to grow some of your own food and become more self-sufficient. That's what we're all about here at Epic Gardening. So thank you for watching. Good luck in the garden. I'm gonna take my leak and head on home.